So I plan to cover what I consider to be the the part of the API I use 80% of the time. So I hope that when you're done with watching this video, you will be able to write a lot of very useful stuff just based on this video uh, and maybe looking at the previous one for how to compile and uh, understanding how Lua loads C modules. Uh, I'm, I'm especially excited about this video because I spent some time building a custom C module just for teaching the C API and I really want to show that off. I think it's kind of fun to use. Um, I also, I like using the C API, Lua C API, because I think it's well designed. Um, just like my previous video, this is a live stream. So this is a one take video. And um, if you're interested in watching future live streams, you can subscribe to me on livecoding.tv. Uh, I'll include a link in the description for this video. And I hope that people watching can ask questions and they benefit. And I hope that um, people watching on YouTube can also benefit from the questions that people ask during the live stream. So, you know, I hope it adds value. So uh, this is part of a video series. And um, the last video, like I said, talked about compiling and loading modules, just like what are the compiler flags? Um, how do you get the header files that you need, stuff like that. So I'm not gonna talk about that much in this video. Uh, this video is all about Lua's stack and about the uh, how to look at tables, how to um, read values and write values to and from the stack. Lua is garbage collected and C is not. And Lua has tables, C does not have tables. So there's a few sort of uh, differences in design to uh, workaround that the C API has to do. And it, it does accomplish those things, you know, and I'm going to talk about how the stack accomplishes those. The next video, I'm going to talk about function calls, handling errors. They're basically kind of like exceptions, uh, how to compile Lua code at runtime. You can do all that stuff from the C API, and I'll talk about it in the next video. That stuff I consider to be more advanced, and I actually use it less often than the stuff I'm talking about in this video, just sort of the essentials, the main stuff. Um, and in the future, I plan to talk about how to get class-like behavior in the C API using user data. Um, I also want to talk about building your own interpreter or framework. That's another future video idea. Uh, so that's just the context of where this whole video series is going. Okay, so specifically, right now I'm going to talk about writing values to the stack, uh, uh, reading values, manipulating the stack, and using tables. And I will explain a little bit more about what the stack is in the first place. Um, if you have any, if you're watching on YouTube, and if you have any ideas about future videos that you would like to have uh, different content or other topics, anything related to programming, uh, especially game programming, like OpenGL, game engines, um, linear algebra, stuff like that, uh, that's stuff I love, and I would be very happy to make videos about that. Yeah, so request it in the comments, please. Let's see. Okay, what is the Lua stack? So in computer science, the word stack has, hey Rock, welcome to the room, has a very specific meaning. Uh, a stack is basically, you think of it as a stack of books, where you can put things on the top of the stack, you can take things off the top of the stack, but it's very awkward to change anything on the bottom of the stack. And this is a nice data structure because adding and removing things is constant time. It's very fast. Um, and just in case you are setting up a dynamic memory environment where you want to change the size of the stack over time, it's usually very easy just to allocate a little more memory uh, at the end of the stack and let it keep growing. Um, as opposed to, say, a uh, more complicated data structure like I don't know, like a balanced binary tree, or even just a contiguous array of, of memory where you might insert or remove items from the very beginning of the array, in which case you have to either like change where the beginning is or you have to move all that memory around. So stacks are efficient, but they have limited access. So the Lua stack is very similar, but it, it actually does allow you to insert things in the middle of it and remove things. It's just that um, the default operation is to push things on top of the stack or remove things popping from the top of the stack. And um, basically the reason 
that Lua does this, it does it because it sort of reflects the call stack. It also allows Lua to garbage collect those values and to um, uh, work with tables so that, I guess one way to express it is, let's say that in C you had a pointer to a Lua value and you did whatever you wanted to it and then you were done with it. Well, Lua has no way to know you're done with it, so it couldn't garbage collect those values. So instead of ever letting anyone in C just own the memory, Lua always owns all the memory, and the way it understands when the memory is done is when that value is off the stack, and there's no references to it within the Lua state at all. Okay, so that's the big picture abstract level. And if you're more of a uh, hands-on example learner, that's great because I'm going to give a lot of specific examples of how we're going to work with the stack. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so to demonstrate some of these initial API calls, I've set up a skeleton C function. So this function is called f, and every C function that is called by Lua has the same signature, which means it has the same input types and the same output types. The input type is always a Lua state pointer. Lua state is a struct defined in one of the Lua header files. And a Lua state pointer, it's all you could think of it like an instance of a class, and it holds encapsulated within it everything about the current runtime of Lua. It has all the globals, all the locals, the call stack, um, it has you know, it knows about all the functions that are in scope and the closures of those functions. Um, and it's mostly behind a wall. What's up, Tywin? Welcome to the stream. Um, let's see, and that return value is an int, and that int value, what it means in C, you just return an integer, but from the Lua perspective, that means how many return values are visible in Lua. And you get those actual values from the stack. Okay, so to sort of emphasize the problem being solved here, uh, in C you have a fixed number of inputs, you have a fixed number of outputs. C has no tables. So question is, you know, if in Lua you can have multiple uh, inputs, different number of inputs for the same function, and different number of outputs for the same function, how do you handle that in C? And the way you handle it is that input values go on the stack, output values come from the stack and the number of output values is that return value of this function. Okay, so here I'm returning zero. That means zero return values will be visible in the um, So right now all this function will do is print the stack because I've called this print stack function that I wrote um, before this video. And um, it's just gonna demonstrate right now that the initial values on the stack are the input values to the function called from Lua. So let me demonstrate that for you. I'll call Lua, and I called my demo file uh, demo. Actually, I might have to build it. Let me make sure it's built. Call the make, make on the make file. Now I'm gonna require my demo module. And now when I call f, it says, okay, the stack is empty. If I call f with some values, then those values are on the stack. Okay, and I can call it with a table I can call it with a string, I can call it with a boolean, and all of those values will show up on the stack. Okay, awesome. Awesome sauce. Even better than awesome. Um, so now let's start pushing values on the stack. So here's the first actual C API call that we've gotten to so far. I'm pushing a number. In Lua language, a number is almost always going to be a double. Now I like to do something, I like to, in my C code, uh, have comments that very clearly show what the state of the stack is every time the stack changes. I find that to be very helpful for me in getting my C code right. You might say, Tyler, that's totally extra commenting. Why are you doing that? And I'll say, no, you're wrong. It's extremely useful. It's very much worth it. So let's recompile that. Let's load the module back again. And now when I call f, the stack is not empty. It's got the value 12.3. So, so far, it's very easy, right? I call it a little push number. There's a number in the stack. The nice thing about the API is that 
all the functions are basically this easy, more or less. Um, which is, it's kind of like assembly language. Like learning assembly, it sounds scary because you're talking to the processor, but every individual operation is usually conceptually simple. And the hard part is actually putting together all these operations to do something complicated. So for example, when we get to tables, you'll see that it's a little bit of work. I have to create a table. I have to push values on the stack that I'm gonna, are going to be the values in the table. And then I have to set those values using keys. So you can see that creating a table, whereas in Lua it's one line, and C it's many lines because each operation is very simple in the C API. Um, so let me show off a few more of these uh, writing value functions. So I can also uh, push a string. And um, I'll push a nil value. And uh, what else can we push here? We can push a, a number. No, I already pushed a number. I'll push a Boolean. So in plain C, originally there were no Boolean types. Did you know that? Fun fact. Um, so the way that you, by default, push a boolean in C is that you give it a 0 or a 1. Okay, now if I've, if I've done the stack manipulations correctly in my head, those comments should be accurate. And we can find out. I'm going to make life easy for myself. I'll uh, set up this one line uh, shell command that will load it for me. Okay, now I can call F, and there it is, great. So I think I got it right, 12.3, hi, nil, true. Let's see if that's right, yes. And the reason this args thing is here is because if I were to call F with some arguments, those would come first, okay? So that's how you write values to the stack. Now those are all primitive types, there's no compound types like a table yet, but we will get there, don't worry. Um, let's see what else. If you're interested in this sample code, I made a public gist. I'll include it in the description of the YouTube video. Um, now, one thing I can do here is I can return values in Lua. So I'm going to return three in the C function. And I just want to show you how I'm actually getting three return values. I'm going to rebuild the module. And when I call f now, the last three values of that stack are my three return values in Lua. Okay. So if I were to write a equals f, what do you think would happen? It's going to get the value of the string high. Okay. So let's see what a is. A is high, and I can see what the type of a is. It's a string. Okay. So my call to Lua push string here, because I return three, and this is the first of the last three values in the stack, that became the first return value visible in Lua. So that's how you write values to the stack. All right, next up, I'm going to talk about stack control. Oh, let me mention these two. Um, push L string and F string. Basically, L string is a string with a length. And in Lua, it's perfectly valid to have strings that have zero bytes in them. Um, so let's say you have like a chunk of binary data, like you're downloading a file and you want to store it internally as a string. Totally legit in Lua, you can do that. And um, now the problem is when you're calling push string, it assumes it's a null terminated string. So if it's arbitrary binary data, you want to use this push L string data, which takes an extra parameter, which is the length of that string. That's the L, L's for length. Then there's a push F string, which is a formatted string, and it looks it works similarly to printf. It is a variadic function. It, you know, it takes L, capital L is the first parameter, always. Then it takes a format string, just like printf. And then after that, whatever values are going to be inserted into that format string. So it's sort of like a printf, but it pushes that string onto the stack instead of printing it. Mm, coffee. All right. So manipulating the stack. Now one thing that's interesting about the C API is that it doesn't really hold your hand. 
you can mess up and um, if you use it incorrectly it doesn't give you a nice friendly error it says oh I'm sorry you used to be incorrectly it doesn't do that it's just gonna like crash or maybe burn down your house or something so you have to be careful the how you use it and um, one of the things it does not do for you is it does not guarantee to grow the stack for you so if you keep pushing values um, by default you have 20 stack values uh, available when your function is called. You could push more than 20 values and Lua does not guarantee that that'll work. If you try pushing values after a certain point, um, after like 20 is the default number, then you have undefined behavior. Uh, the way to get around that is to use this check stack function. So what, what that does is basically you could make sure you have at least a certain amount of space available. So I could check stack, I could call like 50. Now, I won't see any change in the behavior of this program. Let me rebuild it. Um, but, so that it behaves the same, but what's happening internally is that I have guaranteed a capacity of at least 50 on the stack. Um, and generally, your stack is not going to grow arbitrarily large. Like usually you'll know just by statically looking at your code exactly how many stack values you need. So that's why that's a very practical thing to do. Um, to have a stack that doesn't grow dynamically. Uh, git top. Okay, if I call Lua git top, that tells me how many values are actually on the stack. Okay, so let me run that. Oops. So it says four values on the stack right now, which is true. I'd be concerned if it gave me a different number. So set top allows you to just change the size of the stack. It, and what it will actually do is actually truncate the stack. So let's say you have 20 values on the stack and you say set top 10, it'll just discard the top 10 values. If you have one value on the stack, and you call set top 10, it'll add 9 mils so that you actually have 10 values on the stack. Um, now insert, pop, push value, remove, and replace, all of those functions move things around within the stack. So insert will insert the top value into whatever position you have. So here my top value is true. Now I'm going to call insert, um, I'm going to do something interesting just to mix it up. I'm going to Called insert negative three. I haven't told you yet what negative numbers do, but they have a very specific meaning. Negative three is the third place counting from the right. So negative one is the top of the stack, negative two is the second from the top of the stack, etc. And insert will basically uh, put the top value at the place you tell it, negative three, and then push everything else to the right. Okay, so let's test that out, make sure I set the the right thing. I'll call F. Yeah, so it's 12.3 true high nil. Right. Um, pop, let's see, pop will just remove, oops, <laughs> trying to type vim commands in keynote. Pop will remove a certain number of values from the top of the stack. So let me just remove the topmost value. That's going to be a nil removed, and that should be the resulting stack. Um, remove will remove an arbitrary position. So I'm going to remove negative 3. And that's going to be that 12.3 value. I'm going to just pop that, uh, remove it. Uh, let me just run it to show you that I'm actually on track with my comments. Yeah, true and higher there. And, and just to emphasize that these args are still a possible presence, let me add some args and you'll see what happens. I'll call it with one, two, three inputs. So the stack is one, two, three, true high. Those are the args. Um, let's see what else. Uh, push value, it takes the value that you give it. So let's see, I'm going to give it one. Whatever is the first argument here is going to be added as the top value of the stack. So it's kind of a copy operation. Um, let me show you in practice what they can do. So in this case, it just copied true, so it says true, high, true. Now if I had given it arguments, the first value on that stack 
is going to be a 1, and that's going to be the value that gets copied instead of true. So it's 1, 2, 3, true, high, 1. Okay. And that's why I wrote arg1 here, because you know, it's, it kind of depends on what values come into the stack. Now generally, what I've been doing is I've been leaving the input arguments on the stack. It's usually useful to take them off the stack. Just, you know, put them into C variables so you know what they are. And I'll show you how to do that. And then take them off the stack so you completely know what the stack is. That makes it easier to work with the stack instead of having this unknown number of arguments at the beginning like I do. Uh, and then replace will take your first argument and replace, I mean, the, your top value in the stack and replace whatever index you give it. So in this case, I'm going to replace uh, negative 3 which is this true value, with arg1. Um, and I believe that that also pops arg1. Let's test it out. Yeah, true high, is that right? Yes, it is right, because in my case, arg1 was true, because I gave nothing. Uh, but just to emphasize that it is arg1. Yeah, so it's args, arg1, high which is what I have here, args, arg1, hi. Hi. All right, now, I have something really cool in store. I have written some software specifically for this tutorial video. Um, and basically what I created is a API demo module. And you can install it, it's open source. I'll include the GitHub link in the video description. If you want to install it, you can, assuming you have Lua rocks, you can, run sudo lurox install api demo don't look at my password all right so now i'm reinstalling it i already had it but i just want to show you how to install it um, and then if you want to load it up you have to type api demo equals require api demo api demo setup globals and then call Lua L new state to get um, a virtual Lua state. Now what you can do is you can actually call C API functions essentially from Lua. And just to be clear about what's actually happening here, I'm running in Lua, this is a Lua interpreter, and I'm simulating the C API. So the real C API only runs from C. But I've set up this module that mimics it within Lua just to help you learn how um, every API function call actually works. And I've implemented something like 80% of the C API in this um, module, API demo module. So let's push some other things on here just to keep seeing how it works. Every time I manipulate the stack in this demo, it shows me exactly what that manipulation has done. So I can pop values off the end of the stack. I'll pop two values off. Um, I can push nil. Um, let's push another string on. I. Uh, and then I can do, uh, let's do an insert. And I'm just sort of demonstrating that the same stuff I was doing before in C works here, it works in exactly the same way. And in fact, the internal implementation of this just directly uses the exact C function call that it's simulating. I didn't rewrite the API, I just cut, wrapped it, basically. Um, okay, and so from now on, for most of this video, I'm going to use this to show off the C API, but I just, I wanna make it super clear that when you're actually using it, I think you know this, but I like to be super clear, you're writing in C code. So the real deal is writing in C code, and this is just for teaching purposes. I'm running in the Lua interpreter. All right. So, what's next? Um, all right, now I wanna show you how to read values now this is where we started getting into a lot more uh, functions. So, so far all we can do is manipulate the stat and um, push things on the stack. Not very useful if you want to get stuff off the stack, right? So, 
sometimes you care about the type of values on the stack. So one thing you can do is you can say, well, what's the Lua type of a certain stack value? So this will tell me the Lua type as an integer of the last value in the stack. Negative one means the last value, the top of the stack. So the return value there was zero. Now, in C, you would have an int that holds that value. And then what you can do is you can look at these constants. These are constants that would be defined in C. Um, Lua underscore T and then the type name. So I can see, um, is it a string? Is it a table? Is it, um, what other types are there? Boolean. Um, and so, you know, just looking at these integers, I can see that the type of the top of the stack is zero, which is the same type as nil. Um, and there are other ways in C to get the type. So I can call Lua L type name top of the stack. And that will return a string. And that string in this case is nil. If I give it um, the first index into the stack, that's going to be the string high, it's going to say, hey, that's a string. And if I give it the second index, it's going to say, oh, that's a number. Awesome. Um, now, generally, if you're writing a C function, and uh, it's very common that you want to check the types of your arguments. Sometimes you're going to accept different arguments. So you don't always have to enforce that it's a certain type. Sometimes you just want to very passively check it. Sometimes you want to aggressively check it. Aggressive meaning you're going to throw an error if it's the wrong type because you expect a certain type. But I'll show you how to passively check the types. You can call something like is number, who is number, and it returns zero, which in C is equivalent to false. Uh, And there's a whole slew of these is type uh, functions. So I could say, is, is it a string? Yes, I got a one back as my return value, and it's a string. And each time that I'm running any of these functions, it's printing out the stack, and I, it's just kind of emphasizing that the stack is not changing when I call these functions. They're pretty passive. They don't change the stack. Um, you could probably guess what all of these functions do, these is functions. One thing that's interesting is the is none function because none is not a type in Lua. And what it means is that uh, the Lua stack can have more capacity than number of elements it's holding. So um, what you can do is you can refer to indices in the stack where nothing exists. So for example, the stack is only three, has three values. If I refer to index four, there's nothing there. It's not even a nil. It's different than a nil. So is none um, means there's nothing there, not even a nil. Okay. So in Lua itself proper, nil is the only like nothing value, and in C there's nil and none, and those are two different things. Okay. None means that the, the stack is not valid at that point, and nil means the stack is valid at that point, and the value is nil. I hope that's clear. If that's not super clear, I think if you just get some experience with the um, with actually writing this code, it sort of clicks. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about the two functions. These functions will actually give you the value at the stack. All right, so now we're getting to actually really reading values. Sorry, sometimes I hear noises outside uh, my house. I'm like, what is that? So um, what I just did is I got a double, effectively, out of Lua2 number. Um, I like to dive into detail, so I'm going to tell you why Lua calls it Lua number and not a double. Uh, if you look at some of the Lua source code, the header files, there's a file called lua.conf, which is a configuration file. And you can search for Lua number in all caps. And there's a preprocessor defined here. And it defines it as a double. So literally, in C, if you're looking at the type, now the actual type that you want to work with is lowercase Lua underscore capital N and then number. Um, I think Lua does it like this because they want to, um, I think they're following the convention that preprocessor macros are all caps. Um, and they want this configuration file to not really have any code in it, just have defines and allow implementers to change the types that Lua works with. So Lua number is not guaranteed to be a double. It could be 
a long, a long, long double. Um, you could even choose to make it an integer type, although that's uh, relatively rare. Like, when would you make an integer type? Maybe if you're working in an embedded system on a very small processor, like in a, uh, like a toy processor. Maybe it's a very small embedded system that's going to be like in a, a hearing aid. I'm just making up an example where the processor could be very simple, and you might not even have a double type. Lua can still work in that environment, and all the numbers can be integers. And you know, Lua is built to be very flexible like that. Uh, and I just like to give people background around about what's the difference between Lua underscore number and double. 99% of the time, it's literally the same thing. And then you might have some special case um, architectures, like platforms, where people have compiled Lua so that it's actually a different type. Okay. So, so that's some fun background. Now I can call Lua to string on a value that is a string, and Lua will give me a string. You have to be careful about calling Lua to string. Uh, two things can go wrong. One, one is that Lua owns the memory that it returns to you. And what that means is if you mess with that memory, you are messing with Lua. <laughs> and if you are messing with Lua, uh, things could explode. Your, your code could crash. Lua expects you to not mess with its memory. It assumes you're not going to. So when, look, if you, do mem if you do mess with it, for example, if you free it, if you try to free it, um, if you write to it as if it's like an arbitrarily long buffer, and Lua only has so much memory allocated for that string, you could overwrite Lua's memory. So when you get this return value from Lua 2 string, it's a read-only value for you. And not only that, it's garbage collected by Lua, so if you're holding on to that uh, pointer in C, and then Lua garbage collects that string, then you're pointing to unallocated memory. And a lot of things could go wrong when you do that. So basically, it's a temporary read-only value. If you want to hold on to it in C, make a copy of it. All right. And then one other caveat with uh, Lua 2 string is that um, if you have a number and you call Lua 2 string on that number on the stack, it converts the number in the stack to a string. Um, and sometimes you want that to happen, but sometimes you don't. So basically, just keep that in mind when you're calling Lua 2 string. So I'm going to call Lua 2 string on 12.3, and you can see what's happened is what I've gotten back is a string. And the stack has changed. It changed what was internally stored as a number into the string, you know, with characters one, two, dot, three. Okay? So Lua 2 string also converts. Um, and then if you want, if you know you want an integer, you can call Lua 2 integer. And um, let's see. Yeah, I guess it does work on strings. I think it'll convert it, the string, if it can convert it to a number, it'll convert it to a number. And since I call it to integer, it's going to cast it to an int or whatever Lua underscore integer type is is uh, compiled as. All right. So that covers most of the reading functions. There's one other set of functions. By the way, for people watching the stream, um, it'd be great if you guys have any questions. You guys or girl, girls or gals or women, you know, try to be gender neutral. I say you guys by default. I'm still in the process of uh, correcting myself because I'm trying to be more gender neutral. Um, so yeah, questions are encouraged. Anything about the C API, I'd be happy to answer right now. So I'm going to talk about Lua L opt, integer, opt number, opt string. Um, those functions take an extra parameter, let's see, which is going to be a default value. So sometimes, like in C++, you have default values for function arguments. And um, Lua tries to make it easy for you to have default values by using these functions. So let's see. Oh, uh, yeah. I think I didn't implement that function in the API demo, sorry. So that's the reason that error happened is that I um, I wrote it in the slide, but I didn't implement it in the module. So that's my fault and not the API's fault, just to be clear. Uh, so I'm going to call Lua L op number instead. 
And what's going to happen is Lua is going to look at that parameter in the stack. It's going to look at index 2 in the stack. It's going to say, can I convert this to a number? So it's either a string that represents a number or an actual number, and it returns it if it can't. Now, if it's not one of those things, a number or a string that can convert, then it's going to use my default value. So to demonstrate the default value, I'm going to look at the third value in the, strat, the stack, and this time it's going to return 34. Okay. So these opt, Lua L opt something, it looks in the stack, if it can give you something you want of the right type, it does. If it can't, that third value that you sent in is the default value for the stack. Okay, so I can show you again with uh, Lua opt string. I think I implemented that one, let's find out. Yeah, same thing. Um, and by the way, you might be wondering, okay, most of these functions start with Lua underscore something. Some of these functions start with Lua capital L underscore something. Why are they different prefixes? And that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. It basically, Lua distinguishes between uh, the core API and an auxiliary uh, sort of like a layer on top of that core API. Now, for practical purposes, it's all kind of the same. It's all the API. Um, but just to let you know, sort of, I guess one thing you might care about is which header file is it defined in. Everything Lua underscore is going to be essentially defined in Lua.h. And everything Lua capital L underscore is going to be defined in Loxlib.h. Lua auxiliary library. L-A-U-X-L-I-B.h. So the header files are different. And the lib stuff is always defined as wrappers, very thin wrappers around the core API stuff. But other than that, there's not really much difference. And if you, you know, you could sort of ignore the differences if you want, but that's just why the names are different. So that's everything I wanted to talk about with regards to um, reading basic values. Uh, I guess I didn't talk about Lua typing. I forgot that. I'll tell you what that does. So Lua type name takes... Um, a Lua type and returns a string. Now a raw Lua type by itself is an integer in C. It's a C int. And the Lua type name function converts that int to a string, a C string. Okay, so um, I could also call that on these constants like that. And it gives me a string value back. Okay, all right, now that's actually everything for reading values. And the last set of functions in the API I want to talk about are the table functions. There's a lot you can do with these few functions. Um, I mean, it's all stuff, like I said earlier, it's all stuff that in Lua, it's like one line to define a table with specific values. In C, it's multiple function calls because each little C function call does only a small step at a time. Lua new table, so do I need capital L? No. Lua new table just pushes on an empty table, a new empty table at the end of the stack. Excuse me. So that's how you get new tables. I'll push another one just for kicks. Uh, next I'll talk about setting and getting values. Um, and to start with, I think I'll talk about globals. Um, and I'm going to start by getting the version string. So the get global function takes one parameter, which is the string key in the global table. So as a reminder, all the globals in Lua are always stored in a table, and that table is the variable name underscore capital G. And in the C API, you can uh, access values by using this get global function. What, it, what it'll do is it'll look up the key underscore version in this example, and it will push the result, resulting value on the top of the stack. If that key is not in the table in the globals, it's not an error, it just pushes nil. So let's see what version is. So I'm running version 5.1 and I push the string Lua 5.1. Let me show you what happens when I use a key that doesn't exist. What's up, Sinistar56? So here's a key that doesn't exist. Nil is the value of that key. All right? And I can also set globals. 
So uh, let's see, is A, yeah, A doesn't exist as a global, but I can change that. I can say Lua set global A. Ah, I almost messed up. Um, when you call set global, it pops the top of the stack and uses that as the value. So I need to push a number here. And then I'll call set global. All right. So what it did is it popped the stack, the value 42. And now if I look at the value of a, a is equal to 42. Okay. So that's how you manipulate globals in the C API. And that type of interface is actually very similar to how you uh, add and remove values from tables using the C API for any table. Okay, so let me um, pop some values off the top of the stack. So now I have this empty table at the top of the stack. Now what I want to do is um, I'm going to set a key equal to a value on that uh, top table. Okay, so I push the string value and now I'm going to call Lua set field L. Um, shoot, I actually kind of forget the uh, order of the argument, so I'm going to look it up. Just a second. Actually, this is a good opportunity for me to show you how to look up values. Um, I'll show you two ways to do it. Hold on. Yeah. You could look at the Lua.org reference manual. And another way to do it is that the API demo has a help string. So this is the reference manual, and you can basically just find whatever function you're trying to uh, find the details of. I'll increase the font size so you can read this. Whoa. All right, here it is. So this function takes the state L, the index, and then the name of the, darn it. Come back. All right, and then it takes this key name as the third parameter. Every time I resize the window, my scroll position is lost, which is annoying. But basically I went to lua.org and I looked up the stuff. And if you're using the C API, it's extremely useful to often go to lua.org and look at the docs. Um, so let's see, I'm going to call set field, and my table is at index 2, negative 2, which means the second from the top. And then the key will be the string key. Okay, so now I've set up my table so that it has a key called key and a value called value. And I can make the key or the value arbitrary types. So let's push a number, and then I'll call set field again. And this time I'll edit uh, the table at value negative three, and I'll give it a key called monkey. All right, cool. So that's what set field does. Set field assumes the key is a string, though. So if you want your key to be not a string, then you need to use a C API function call called set table. So let me push um, I'll push a boolean, and then I'm going to use that as the key. So that's going to be the key, and then I'll push uh, another string, and I'll call it uh, another value. No, I'll call it value two. Keep it shorter. And now I'll call Lua set table, and uh, this time my table is at index negative three, third from the top. And I think that's all I need. Yes, that's right. So now if I look at that table, it has a key that's the boolean value true, and the value of that key is the string value two. Okay. Uh, Lua get table does something kind of similar where, let's see, I have to push my key first. So I'm gonna push the key key. And now I'm gonna call Lua get table. My table is at position negative two now. And what that did is it popped my key value is the top of the stack. It looked at index negative two, and it found that key, and then it pushed the value. Now, in case I um, were to call it Lua get table where that key didn't exist, 
what it's going to push at the end of the stack is the value nil. Just like in Lua. If I look up a key that doesn't exist in table, you get the value nil. Okay? So I've covered get table, set table, get field, set field. Um, I've covered set global, get global. And for people just joining the room, welcome. I'm happy to answer your questions. And I plan to post this uh, video to YouTube. Uh, if you, in case you missed the beginning and we'll say the beginning. And it's always archived on live coding that TV too, anyway. So I haven't covered get meta table and set meta table. Uh, those are, I think those are fairly straightforward. Um, I'm going to pop the top value. Now, if I, if I remember correctly, set meta table will take the top table and make that the meta table for whatever's at the index you give it. So I'm giving this index negative two, which means the second value from the top of the stack, which is the monkey table. The monkey table will gain a meta table, which is the top value in the stack. All right, yeah, so what has happened is the top value of the stack has been popped. And that table became the meta table for the monkey table. Now, if I wanted to get that meta table back, well, actually, first let me show you what happens when I try to get the meta table of a, something that doesn't have a meta table. I think it'll, I think it will return zero. Let's see. Get meta table of that. Yeah, so this in this case it returned zero because it didn't have a meta table and it didn't push anything on the stack. Now if I call get meta table negative two, there is a meta table there. So the C function would return one and it pushes the meta table onto the stack. All right, so that's how you can deal with meta tables, uh, just getting them and setting them. Uh, now Lua adds a couple more functions. Um, let me make sure that I have Lua Object length here. Yeah. So Lua 5.1 defined a function called Lua object length, which is if it's a if your table is a sequence, it's the number of elements in the sequence. A sequence is defined such that uh, it has the keys one, two, three, four, contiguous numbers, all with non-nil values. Okay, that's a sequence. It's a table, but it's a table with a special structure. And then uh, in Lua, if you use the pound sign, like the number sign that gives you the number of elements in that table. All right? So, And you get the same functionality in C API by calling Lua, if it's Lua 5.1, you call Lua objlen, and if it's Lua 5.2 or 5.3, you call Lua rawlen. They changed the name of the function in Lua 5.2. Um, so I'm going to set up a table that is a sequence. Let me pop some values here so we, the stack isn't too big. Um, I have a new table, and now what I can do is I can use uh, Lua raw set i, and what that will do, um, raw set i, you first you give it the index, well first you always give it l, then you give it the index of the table you're going to work with, which is, I'm going to use negative 2, and then I'm going to give it the key. So raw set i means I'm going to set a value with an integer key. And the last parameter of this function is the integer key you're setting. Okay, And this is just printing it in the printout. It says stack high 12.3 mil monkey a. That last syntax is the standard Lua syntax for a table that is a sequence. You can leave out the keys if it's a sequence. Um, let me push a few more strings. I'll push, uh, oh. Yeah, I'll push um, B, and just for kicks, we'll push C. Oh, the reason the word raw is in there is that um, it doesn't call any meta methods. So in Lua, you know, if a table has a meta table, you can give it um, special keys underscore underscore index or underscore underscore new index and that allows you to sort of override the functionality for setting keys and the C API respects those meta methods by default so if you're calling set table to set a value in a table it will call the meta methods 
whether, even if they're implemented in Lua or if they're implemented in, this, in C, it doesn't matter. Um, meta methods always happen by default, except if you call Lua underscore raw something. That raw word just means ignore all meta methods. It's sort of like, if you use the JavaScript, there's this has own property method that you can call it something and can figure out if uh, an object directly owns a property or if it's somehow from the prototype of that object. Now, if you don't know JavaScript, you can ignore what I just said. Um, but basically, raw the raw underscore ignores things that aren't inherently properties of the table, but are properties that are sort of uh, owned by other tables and sort of connected through the meta table. I apologize if that's a little bit. So um, one thing I want to get here is the object length of this table to show you that it works. Oops, almost forgot the capital L. Okay, so the C return value is three for the object length of that sequence because there's three things there. Um, now raw set and raw get, I actually kind of forget the types. Actually, this is a good opportunity for me to show you the help string here. So if, if you're using the API demo module, you can type API demo help, and you will get this massive string which covers a huge portion of the API, um, and it can remind you of stuff like what I just forgot. So raw set, it pops the top two values in the stack, and those two values are going to be the key and the value of the stack. And basically, it's just like set table, except that it doesn't make any meta calls. Now this, to be honest, this help string is not gonna be very useful if you're learning because it's too terse. It's like a quick reference. It is very helpful if you've learned it once and you've, like me, you've forgotten the details. I do that all the time. I know conceptually what's going on, but I always forget the details. So I always am looking at quick references, which is why I love quick references. Um, so that's API demo help string. Um, yeah, so raw set and raw get are just like get table and set table, but they uh, ignore meta methods. And then the very last function I want to cover in this video is Lua underscore next. And Lua underscore next is basically how you can iterate over a table in the C API. Hold on. So in Lua, let's go to Lua for a second. If you want to iterate over a table, See, key one equals value one, key two equals value two. All right, now I've set up this table, um, and I can use a generic for loop to iterate over those key value pairs. Um, and basically, I'm using this pairs function to help me out. Now, that pairs function doesn't directly exist in C, so I'm going to use a function called Lua underscore next. And the way it works, I'm just going to print out this stack. So the way it works is that um, you always have to push nil first, and then, let's see, what I do is I give it the index of the table that I'm talking about. It will pop the top value of the stack and treat that as the last looked up key. With, and nil is a special case, because nil is never a valid key. So um, when you start with nil at the top of the stack, it will just get the first key in a full iteration of the table. Okay, so what it's done is it's popped nil off the top of the stack. It says, okay, nil is a special case, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give the first uh, key and value pair, and I'm going to give it on the stack. In C, the return value of Lua next is 1, which means that um, I did push stuff on the stack. If it was zero, it would mean that you had hit the end of the table. Um, and so what I can do is I can keep iterating over that table. I can call Lua pop, I pop off that value. So now the last value in the stack is the last key looked up. That's sort of an invariant. I'll repeat it because it helps you understand Lua next. Every time you call Lua next, you want the top of the stack to be the last value looked up. And it's sort of a special case that nil is your, your like sort of like initial value, I guess you would say. 
So let me call Lua next again, and we'll see that it's popping that value one, it's giving me the next key. Just like in regular Lua, the order of the elements is not guaranteed. In this case, it actually worked out one, two, three, but that's not guaranteed by the API. Um, so, and let me repeat those last two commands again. And now this time, the return value was zero in C, and on the stack, there's nothing at the end. Okay, so the design of this, I can actually write um, a function. I'll write a function in, in Lua. Um, what we're going to do first, we're going to push nil. And then what we can do is we can say while um, Lua next L negative 2 is not equal to 0, two, um, I will print the last value. So the last value is going to be a string. So I'm going to print Lua to string L negative 1, which is the last value of the stack. And then we're going to pop that last value. Um, all right, so let's see if that worked. I might have a mistake there. Yes, that worked. That did exactly what I wanted to. Uh, now, these stack printouts are from C. Lua is printing out A, B, C. Those are just the values in the table. Um, and we can see what happened is I pushed nil, I called Lua next, and then this is from the Lua pop. Oh, no, it's not from the Lua pop call. This is, this is from the two-string call that prints this up. Um, so basically, this is the type of loop that you can write in C to iterate over a table. It's not, you know, it's not C, but if you, it's very easy to convert what I wrote there into C. It's almost line for line um, something you could copy. You just have to change the syntax a little bit. That is everything that I wanted to cover um, let me emphasize a couple of things that will help you follow through on this. Um, I'm going to show you one more time how to get the uh, Lua.org manual. Um, I'll tell you how I usually do it. I look up Lua reference manual. I Google for that. And you can look up the version specific manual for your version of Lua. So I often use 5.1 because Lua JIT is set to uh, 5.1, but you might want to use 5.2, 5.3, whatever you're using. And then that has all of these C API functions explained in detail. And if you like the API demo module that I taught with, um, here's the link for that. And I'll also include the link in the description of the YouTube video. And this includes this giant help file, which is a much more condensed help string for the, not the entire API, but the vast majority of the API, the C API. So that is everything. Thank you very much for watching. And um, I look forward to streaming and YouTube posting the next video about, um, I'm gonna talk about function calls, errors, and in the future, I'll also talk about making frameworks and making interpreters and more fun stuff. All right, see you guys next time.